This GT is dead. Listen to this. Last time I rode it through rain, even though this whole board is badgered and has a cable retention clip installed, the motor plug still somehow got shorted. Don't know if you can see this pin, but it is sooty. On the controller side, half of this phase wire pin is gone. I'm pretty sure somehow water got in here and then shorted something against this pin. And that I think is the only thing that broke. I've been waiting for this board to break so I can vesk it. At this point, I'm only guessing what the issue is. To figure out if the connector is the only thing that broke, I wanna see if I can get a good motor detection. If the motor spins nicely when I bypass the connector, then I can reuse the motor. Step one, void the warranty. Then break the BMS. This battery is chunky. <laughs> Next up, I'm removing the BMS and the controller out of this board. For this build, I'm using the trusty U-Box 80 volt again. You make your life a bit easier if you're using the U-Box 100 volt because you can use the Ava Sparks 100 volt adapter to the GT box. This is my commuter board, which means it's gotta be waterproof to survive the road salts during New York City snowstorm. The GT motor connector has already proven to be absolute dog shit, even when there is no water. So even if this connector is intact, I don't want to use it. In my opinion, the best connector is no connector. It's one less part to fail, one less chamber to waterproof. Plus, if we can use the cable gun, we can run beefy phase wires directly into the motor to up the current draw without the connector being the bottleneck for performance. Step one is cutting the GT motor plug and circumcising the cable. This looks very familiar. Three phase wires and six hall sensor wires. To figure out which wire does what, I probe the connector and reference community resources. The gist is, on the hall sensor wires, red and black are positive and negative, and white is temperature, and the rest are hall 1, hall 2, and hall 3, which are all interchangeable. Now I just gotta wire the GSC according to how the U-Box likes it, and solder on some bullet connectors onto the phase wires. The GT rear box has reverse polarity XT60s, but the front box actually has regular polarity. This means the harness is basically a reverse to regular polarity adapter. To get this working, I also plugged in the included power button and Bluetooth module so I can trigger a motor detection on Vestool. Fingers crossed! Fantastic! Hall sensors are detected and the detection values are all reasonable. This means the hypercore can be reused. And the next step is to fit everything into the GT frame. The front box comes with these studs, which leaves no room for any controller. Step one is just to get rid of the stud. The front box is made out of cast aluminum and is surprisingly soft. I first use a large drill bit to chew through most of the material, then switching to an oscillating and sanding head to flush out the edges and at the same time removing the powder coating for better thermals. While I'm at it, I'm also gonna sand down the bottom side because why not? By the way, highly recommend this Black & Decker power tool. It does all this and a few more tricks all in one package. Next up is making some kind of holder that can fit the U-Box in. I don't want some kind of riser because going through five millimeters of thermal pad or aluminum will completely destroy the thermals. I want the U-Box to be pressed against the bottom of the box. And I also don't want to drill studs because I want this box to be waterproof. So it's time to take it to Fusion 360 to whip out a holder. If you want the STL, 
It's in the pinned comment down below. After a few revisions, the holder fits. Once the lid closes, it'll press the face wires and secure it down even further. Next up, the BMS. Tony seems to be able to bypass the stock BMS, and I'm very curious as to how he made it work, because I'm not sure whether the braking happens in the controller or the BMS. Regardless, Future Motion BMS is like a black box, and I don't want something that I don't understand in my board. I'm going with the Flipski BMS and rewiring the balance leads with a breakout board. This part is a little bit tricky because it's very easy to accidentally swap two wires or have all the wires shifted by one. Just make sure when you're doing this, keep track of every wire and do it one at a time. Also be mindful of your cable length. To make this more reliable, I'm sealing off the GSD end with some silicone and then sealing the breakout board end with liquid tape, which is the liquid version of electrical tape. Next up, charge port diode. Just like my last build, I'm gonna put in a ridiculously over-engineered cooling solution. Essentially, this unnecessarily thick battery box lid is gonna be the cooler for this diode. Since I'm resolving the harness, I'm making it standard polarity and adding in this adapter that does a few things. It's a Y splitter that splits the battery XC60 to both charge and discharge. The charge circuit is then split where the charge positive goes through a diode and charge negative goes through the BMS. This part is a little bit messy, so let's pause on this for a second so you can take a closer look. This Y splits on the harness side, but remember, electrons doesn't care about making a sharp turn. I'm splitting it here so that the charge wires doesn't have to bend the U-turn to face the charge port. This part, I'm using the same trick as the last video, wrapping the diode in thermal pad and then bolting it onto the BMS cover. If you want the SDL, it's in the pinned comment too. The GT has a very weird charger bolt. It's this metal nut that pushes their proprietary charge port to the box. You can also reuse this charge port if you want, but for my build, I'm replacing it with a GX16 3-pin connector. If you're not aware, as per community standards, use 3-pin for 18S, 2-pin for 19S, and 4-pin for 20S. The charger side has a metal lip, which makes it too thick to pass through the metal nut to reach the charger, so it's very easy to just trim it. After some sanding, the GX connector is able to be plugged and unplugged without issues. Since these connectors doesn't come with O-rings, I sealed it off on the back with some silicone. Now, moment of truth. Plugging the charger for the first time always scares me, but charger light did turn red, which indicates it's charging. After a full charge, the BMS lights up, which means it's balancing correctly. 
Everything in the rear box is now done. So let's seal it up with new gaskets. Sniffer test reveals that somewhere on the rear box, something is leaky. Full life gaskets are very high quality and shouldn't leak, so the only place air can escape is in the charge port. Yep, that's exactly where it's leaking. Some silicone on the inside fixes it. Now let's move back to the controller. The reason for mounting the U-Box in this corner is to leave room for the AvaSpark RGB module. This is a light bar and a light control module built into one. Additionally, it can also act as an adapter so we can reuse the GT power button. You can reuse the lights as well, but the LCM will not be able to drive the GT high beams. In my case, I'm using the AvaSpark laser beam as the front light and the RGBW as the rear lights. These lights are a bit thinner than stock lights. A dab of hot glue on the bottom and it can be clamped down pretty nicely. Front light just plugs straight in. Rear lights reuses a few spare wires in the harness. To connect the LCM to the U-Box, I'm following the wiring direction on their website. It gets the power supply from the fan port and communicate with the U-Box via the power button port for on-off and the COM port for the UART data. This means it's sharing the COM port with the foot pad, so let's wire that in as well. AvaSpark sells the spare foot pad connector, but you can also just desolder the one on the controller. Side note, it does occupy the TX and RX for UART remotes, but PPM remote will still work. The only downside is PPM remotes versus UART remotes, you do lose the telemetry on the remote display. I will definitely be installing a remote into this board later, it just won't be ready for this video. For now, the LCM isn't reading data from the UART for some reason. I'm still troubleshooting it, but the LCM can still use its internal IMU to determine right direction, which is what I'm doing for now. Now, let's plug in power and test it. I'm first booting up with the latching power button and then updating the U-Box firmware to the momentary firmware, which you can find in the pinned comment below. After updating, the momentary button works. The Bluetooth module can be glued down, and while I'm at it, I'm also gonna add a bit of hot glue to secure the LCM down since it's just held down with one screw at the moment. With the controller and battery module working, we now need to fit the cable gland in, so we can pass all the motor wires through. The hole is big enough, but this notch is preventing the cable gland from sitting in. It's super easy, barely an inconvenience to trim it out. I made a dummy cable that consists of the same wires as the motor wire, just to test waterproofing. This is just the right thickness for the 19 mm cable gland. My heat shrinks aren't long enough to wrap the entirety of the cable, so I string three together. 
I made sure to heat gun this for longer than I usually do to really make sure the glue inside the heat shrink all melted and sealed the cable to be waterproof. I'm pretty sure if you send a pre-haptic buzz board back to Fusion Motion for repair, they will fix it and update the firmware. This is a deal breaker for me because my GT used to be pre-update and re-wheeled. This means as soon as the electronics die, all the accessories that I bought for it will essentially become paperweight. Now that I know this board is user repairable, I felt much more confident buying accessories for it. I decided to get the N42 version of the GT MTE hub because between upgrading battery pack, tweaking field weakening, and upping the controller current limits, you can already configure any combination of torque versus speed. So I didn't feel like magnet option is gonna be that big of a deal. I got the 555 Enduro to pair with the MTE, and honestly, I think it's a great tire for the XR MTE, but on the GT, it feels way too small. You will see what I mean in the right video after. Regardless, full-size 5-inch Enduros are coming, and it's fun to try out a 5.5 in the meantime. Now let's plug the motor in and close the controller box. If the cable gland is cranked down correctly, the front controller is waterproof too. Great, now let's put the board back together and take it for a spin. This board is freaking sick. Jumping back and forth between this board and my 75 volt Vexar with almost the exact same part choice, I can't pick a clear winner. The Vexar has the full size Enduro and has better clearance and a lower ride height, but the GT foot pads are so comfy and the boxes are big and spacious for repair. So should you do this to your GT? Absolutely. But if you would just wait a few months for this build, a lot of parts will be available for you that aren't for me as of now. The float wheel kit will obviously be a great option, but there will also be the Pickle BMS 18S drop-in replacement BMS. Fungineer's male and female motor plug will also be another great addition uh, on top of reusing the stock plug or the cable gland. And float package will be getting an update in January to support light control on select ESCs, such as the Fungineer's Thor 300. There's a wave of vest parts that are almost ready, and if you can just hold off to a summer for this build, you'd make her life a lot easier. But this video shows it's already very possible to Vesca GT and it'll only get easier from now on. By the way, I understand this video is twice as long as my full box video, but that's not because it's significantly harder. I just cut out way too much stuff in that video to keep it 10 minutes-ish. I'm expecting longer form stuff to tank the old mighty algorithm, but I do want to be as comprehensive as possible. So let me know in the comment below if you prefer the full cut like this, or a super trimmed down cut like the flow box video. If you're paying attention in the past few videos, you'll realize that in the build process, I'm just repeating the same thing over and over again, like soldering cable to cable, soldering cable to connectors, plugging in crimped cables, applying heat shrinks. It's, it's the same thing. Building a board seems complex, but it's really just like solving a Rubik's cube by memorizing a few formula. My next video is going to be a soldering tutorial, so anyone can be able to follow along my past three uploads as a blueprint to build a board yourself. If that sounds appealing to you, make sure you're subscribed so you can see it when that video drops. Thanks! Bye!